we are honored to hear from Dr. Craig Chaya, Austin Nakatsuka, uh, and Wade Stoddard. I uh, do just want to uh, note that uh, glaucoma has always uh, been uh, particularly uh, we'll call them shining stars in their work, uh, that they've always been able to uh, deliver some, some really important updates uh, that have helped us all stay up to date on the uh, ever-changing field in glaucoma. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to the team. Okay, great. I will begin. This is Craig Chaya. Good morning to everyone. And I'm going to provide you just with a quick Moran glaucoma service update, some things that have changed and obviously some upcoming things that you can look forward to that we can provide on the glaucoma service. I have no financial disclosures. The first thing I'd like to do is bring your attention to something special that has occurred in room one of the operating room. Uh, this is the perspective from the assistant scope. And as you can see, looking over the patient's bed, in the corner, there's a special photo on the wall. This has been in the works for several months. I'd like to thank the OR committee, particularly Lillian, as well as Angela Burningham for making this happen. And we'd like to aptly name this Crandall's Corner. Alan passed away almost five months ago and our hearts are still very heavy. And we remember him so much of the impact that he had on our training program as well as many of our lives. So now in this corner, you can see Alan is literally looking over our shoulders like he always did from his office or whether he was in the operating room. So we ask that as you operate in room one, pay your respects to Alan or come by and just pay a special visit to remember Alan. He was a true giant in our field and we are truly honored uh, that this room now is dedicated in his uh, legacy. Introduction, this is our glaucoma service line. It's directed by Norm Zabriskie and it includes myself, Susan Chortkoff, Rachel Simpson, Brian Stagg, Barbara Roscoe, and Austin Nakatsuka and Wade Stoddard. I wanna give special recognition to Austin and Wade this year. They've been absolutely tremendous in the wake of Alan's death and have been able to really bolster our service and to provide seamless care for our patients. We provide a full spectrum of care from birth till death for comprehensive glaucoma care. Of note, our pediatric glaucoma service is exclusively managed with our PEDS service, a co-joined, uh, co-managed service. As far as diagnostics, there's nothing new to mention except for those of you that may be familiar with this new parameter on the OCT. Many of you may find it frustrating when you have a patient with significant peripapular atrophy or a tilted disc or a very myopic nerve. And one parameter that you can now measure is the OCT BMO MRW, which stands for Brooks Membrane Opening Mean Rim Width. This is a new parameter that may be helpful uh, for those patients where it's difficult to obtain good RNFL photos. In addition, we have OCTA that's available only here at JMEC, and we also continue to have corneal hysteresis available at our Mid Valley location currently. Other diagnostics include UBM B scan by Dr. Roger Harry, as well as electrophysiology by Dr. Don Creel. I do want to mention that one thing that we can look forward to in upgrades, this was all set back by COVID, but in the future, our visual field machines will be able to perform the strategies of 24-2 CETA faster, which should decrease time for testing, as well as the 24-2 C CETA faster, which is also improved upon the 24-2 protocol by adding more points to the central field. Uh, this is almost doing a combination of 24-2 plus 10-2. As far as diagnostics, we continue to have sleep apnea consultation through our sleep service as well as 24-hour blood pressure monitoring through the EKG lab here at the University Hospital. One new thing that we are just starting preliminary uh, program in is eye care home tonometry. We currently have two devices that are available and we have some current research projects that are being led by Dr. Barbara Roscoe as well as Ariana Levin. As far as medical care, we continue to provide a full spectrum of array of options in terms of medical therapies that are available to patients. One new thing that I'd like to draw your attention to is a new medication that we now have available. This is Darista. Darista is a bimatoprost drug eluding pellet that is placed intracamerally that lasts for approximately four months. In the studies, there were some patients though, up to 25% of patients who had an effect after one pellet injection for up to two years. 
and up to 40% 40 of, pa of patients who had a response past four months up to about a year. So this is something new that we've been doing um, in our community clinics as well as at Moran, but be aware of that if you're doing a diagnostic exam or goniospic, goniospic exam on patients that have had a Darista implant, you may notice a pellet in the inferior angle. As far as surgical care, uh, we now have the newest iteration of the eye stent, the eye stent Inject W. We continue to provide the Hydrus, ABIC, um, and we also continue to have the Omni hook dual blade as well as the GAT procedure. The Zen gel stent is our minimally invasive bypass procedure, and we continue to perform trabeculectomy, all forms of glaucoma drainage devices as well as cyclophotocoagulation. As far as research, we have a number of studies that are ongoing. First, Dr. Rosco is leading our suit exfoliation studies. Dr. Brian Stagg is leading a decision support tool study as part of his uh, major work. And we have some ongoing clinical studies in both outcome surveys, PEDS glaucoma. We also have a new head mounted perimeter that is a freestanding head mounted perimeter um, in partnership with a Japanese company that will be studying along uh, doing a head to head comparison with Humphrey Visual Field. Uh, we also have a study wrapping up led by Dr. Vakunta on pulse diode laser and the effect on patients who have uh, Sturge Weber syndrome. Okay, and that concludes um, our glaucoma service update. Once again, a reminder if you need to get a hold of our service line, the easiest, fastest way is to page our glaucoma fellow on call. You can also ask any OSS to schedule with any of our providers in at the Moran or our community clinics. For those of you that may have interest in um, outside referrals, this applies not only to the glaucoma service line, but uh, applies to any service line. If you need to have a patient from an outside physician that needs to be referred into the Moran for specialty care, um, these are two people that you wanna jot down. Uh, they are in our email system, Jackie Martin, as well as Cheryl Christensen. Both of them have served as OSSs in our community clinics and have now been uh, delegated to running our physician referral line for outside referrals coming in. Thank you very much. And I'll now turn it over to our fellows to present our cases for today. Thanks, Dr. Chaya. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All righty, so hopefully my screen is sharing. Um, so uh, I'm Austin Nakatsuka, uh, previously the cornea fellow here, and uh, now the one of the current glaucoma fellows. Um, and uh, my presentation today is called Angle Closure Glaucoma, What to Do When All Else Fails. And essentially, I'll be sharing two cases that presented with uh, interesting and unique uh, management um, dilemmas. And um, we'll uh, share how we navigated through those um, and these are both angle closure glaucoma cases. Uh, no financial disclosures. So case one. So this is Uh, hello? We can hear you now. Okay, somebody muted me for some reason. Um, this is a 63-year-old female who presented with a red painful eye vision loss and mid-dilated pupil and a pressure of 50. Uh, reportedly occurred upon waking about 2.30 in the morning. Uh, she was initially referred from an outside provider uh, when she came in and her pressure was uh, reportedly about 60s on initial presentation with the outside provider. In terms of her history, um, it was only notable for a recent UTI for which she was on macrobid um, in, uh, in terms of an antibiotic in terms of treating it. Um, otherwise, no uh, previous surgical history or family history of glaucoma uh, this was important to, it's important to look at, especially in these angle closure uh, situations, uh, a, a very thorough med history, uh, because uh, as many of us know, uh, certain medications such as Topamax and other sulfonamide 
derivatives uh, can precipitate an angle closure glaucoma and sometimes even a bilateral angle closure glaucoma. And uh, we've actually had a couple of cases of topamax induced bilateral angle closure glaucoma recently, uh, of which I've had to deal with, um, but this was not the case for this patient. So um, upon review of her history, her outside provider, which actually was earlier in the morning of uh, uh, prior to presentation, uh, I'm sorry, a day before, had tried uh, doing a PI times two, um, had done maximal drops and diamox as well, and reportedly her IOP never went below 46. And, uh, as she, and, and again, upon presentation, her pressure, uh, pressure was 50s. The PI was questionably patent and uh, she was already on max drops and had already taken Diamox. And so um, at Moran, he, uh, the residents have a protocol to deal with the uh, angle closure glaucoma. And it usually involves medical therapy first with maximum with drops, uh, Diamox. And then um, if that does not work, then usually they page the glaucoma fellow and uh, we considered doing PIs and or AC taps. And that was essentially what happened. Um, uh, the patient initially had a PI done by the resident and then the uh, fellow came in and checked and uh, did some additional PI to make sure that it was patent. Uh, multiple AC taps were also done, uh, but it was noted that the pressure kept rising uh, to the 30s and 40s, even when the pressure had been dropped down to uh, in the single digits, and it would rise to the 30s and 40s, about 30 to 40 minutes after these AC taps. Um, so a couple questions people might have. So why were so many PIs done? First off, um, in these acute uh, angle closure situations, the cornea can get very edematous and thickened, and, and the view can become very difficult. And so uh, in terms of actually performing the PI, it can be very difficult. And then uh, also um, making sure that the PI is patent, it makes, it makes it very difficult as well. So sometimes these have to be done multiple times to make sure that um, the laser actually gets through the iris. In terms of the AC taps, there's a couple of reasons for this. So uh, classic thinking is that, you know, why do an AC tap when the, uh, the AC is going to fill within, um, as the residents may know, it should fill within about 100 minutes for a normal person, um, completely fill within at least 80 to 100 minutes. Um, but uh, with AC aqueous suppressants on board, that can uh, theoretically increase the amount of time for the AC to fill. Secondly, um, by lower, acutely lowering the pressure in these situations, um, sometimes it's thought that uh, the canal can actually uh, open, uh, oh, things can open up and uh, spontaneous flow can actually occur. And then finally, um, by lowering the pressure, uh, sometimes that will reduce the amount of corneal edema, which actually itself prevents absorption of these drops. And so that was attempted, but did not, did not work. And so I'm sorry, these are not the greatest pictures, but these are pictures of the um, I, uh, this was act actually after the PI had been done uh, for the fourth time. And, and it was now definitely patent. As you can see here, you can see a pretty cloudy cornea and a mid dilated uh, iris where that is a uh, uh, shallow chamber. And it's all important also to note that the patient was also phakic. And she also happened to incidentally have a very large pterygium as well. And so uh, just very quickly, uh, laser PI is basically a method to um, create another channel for aqueous to be released and uh, access the trabecular meshwork and canal directly once a pupillary block mechanism uh, has been uh, has prevented that from occurring um, by closing up the uh, channel to the um, or, or access of the aqueous directly to the trabecular meshwork. So in terms of her course, she was uh, then admitted for IV diamox um, uh, with the thought that perhaps her absorption orally was not enough. Uh, her pressures were still high. She was actually given mannitol as well. And the mechanism of mannitol is through osmotic um, osmosis, drawing fluid out of the vitreous space. And her pressure was still in the low 40s uh, after that as well. So that was unsuccessful. And so then we moved on to the next um, plan. Uh, so um, instead of just doing a laser peripheral iridotomy, which had already been done, we then moved on to an iridoplasty, which basically involves the argon laser con contracting the iris and pulling peripheral iris stroma away from the angle. 
And this is a uh, just a quick video of how that occurs. Let me just go ahead here. And so essentially this is basically just applying a large spot size of the argon laser with low power and lower duration um, to contract the iris instead of actually trying to uh, pulse through it um, and pull it away from the peripheral, uh, from the periphery. And so this had some effect. The IOP actually went down to the low 30s for about a day or two. Uh, and then rose again to the 40s after that. But it did actually help to clear up the cornea a little bit. Um, and so uh, we also tried adding on Roclitan in addition to her four drop therapy. Um, and essentially, uh, Roclitan is Ropressa and Latanoprost. And for those who don't know, Ropressa is essentially a Rokinase inhibitor um, that uh, is thought to, is another um, a class of medications that uh, increases outflow and, and decreases um, episcleral venous pressure and can sometimes help to lower pressure in those refractory to um, medical treatment otherwise. However, it's, we've been finding it's been very poorly tolerated and so um, often we use it in very unique circumstances. And this is an, uh, I'm sorry, this is not her actual nerve, but her nerve actually looked very similar to this. I realize it's a left eye, but um, and upon examination of her nerve, um, we noted some optic disc swelling and uh, some disc hemorrhages as well. And this is after being able to, to get a good view of her, um, her retina. And uh, as you can see here, she has quite a bit of swelling on her OCT. And so what is going on here? Does she have a CRVO? Does she have an NAION? Um, and so most likely we think that this was the cause of her optic disc swelling and hemorrhages. And so this is something I wasn't actually aware about, Dr. Zabriski pointed out, uh, ocular decompression retinopathy. So essentially this is a retinopathy that occurs um, with hemorrhaging after an acute lowering of pressure. And so it's act it classically occurs after um, trabeculectomies where you lower pressures from the 40s acutely down to single digits. And the mechanism is thought to be either due to vitreous displacement that can cause shearing of the capillaries, um, kind of similar to PVD, or um, actually change in the uh, forward displacement of the lamina cribrosa, which causes decreased axoplasmic flow and, and essentially causes um, some transient ischemia, kind of similar to the mechanism of CRVO. Um, and so this is something that can occur by lowering the pressure acutely and it's generally self-limited, but it can have some long lasting effects. And so this was a B scan that was done by Dr. Harry. And here basically you can see some anterior rotation of the ciliary body and the lens iris diaphragm is, is, is anteriorly displaced. And you can see here as well that the um, angle is, is essentially closed or very narrow. And so what's the next step? Well, essentially this patient really needed uh, uh, FACO. She needed her lens taken out. Uh, and so we ended up doing a combined FACO with an Ahmed tube as well, just because we were um, unclear. Uh, her, she had a, a difficult presentation and we just wanted to make sure that her pressure was uh, adequately controlled. And so we added the tube as well. And this was done about a week from presentation. You might ask, oh, why did we wait even that long? Well, in these cases, it can be very difficult in terms of the view because of the amount of corneal edema that can occur and uh, as well as getting some sort of calculations for a lens. And so what we were trying to do is wait for kind of a window of opportunity uh, for uh, us to kind of get in there and get, uh, get the lens in and, and, and put the tube in. And essentially we were able to do that. Actually the iridoplasty did help with that. And so we kind of got in there and we're, we're put a lens in a tube. And this is just her uh, biometry just kind of wanted to point out um, some things. Her axial length was um, a little shorter than normal, but not that much shorter. Um, her uh, AC depth was, uh, was small and her lens thickness was on the high, borderline high side, um, which um, all of those things would be consistent with or uh, 
putting someone at risk for uh, angle closure. And she's also hyperopic in both sides, as you may note. And so uh, in terms of her course, we've been following her post tube for about uh, two, uh, three months or so. And her pressure has been in the uh, high teens to low twenties, um, but hasn't really dropped too much lower than that. Um, and that's on two to three drops, uh, glaucoma drops, and uh, with her steroid taper down. Um, her best corrected visual acuity is 2040, uh, and, and ocular surface does have a little role in that, but, uh, and her optic disc edema has notably resolved, um, but we don't know how much uh, damage has been done to her retina in terms of the uh, uh, post, um, the decompression retinopathy, but uh, at least her edema has resolved and the hemorrhages have gone away. And then we finally eventually got some form of a visual field, and this is a STEM5, which is why it looks like this. But uh, actually, um, surprisingly, she's surprisingly doesn't have all that many uh, visual field deficits so far as we can tell. Um, so hopefully she does not have um, significant permanent damage to her visual field and nerve that will cause her functional loss um, because of our actions. Uh, case two, um, so this was a different case. This is a 49 year old female who was referred from an outside provider for narrow angles, but she actually initially presented uh, to that provider for a LASIK evaluation, but she had noticed that her vision had been worsening over the past year, especially her peripheral vision and her pressures in that eye were around the thirties and the other eye were actually in the low teens. And she was on, she had no significant past medical history at all. Um, she had slightly thick packies. She was noted to be narrow in both eyes. Uh, and, uh, she, she was phakic as well, but if you notice, she had a very asymmetric cup to disc ratio and she was also hyperopic. But here you can see in this patient's case, her fields were much different and worse than the other patient. Uh, she, she had already had quite a bit of visual field loss already in that, and that's the right eye. Um, and, and the left eye was doing okay. And quite a bit of um, anatomic loss of her uh, optic nerve as well. And so she was started on drops initially um, to see uh, if, if that would uh, do anything because this is obviously much more of a chronic process uh, in, in her case. And uh, at a five day follow up, her pressure had not really budged much. And so because of this, um, initially it was considered to do an LP, LP, excuse me, LPI to help her out. But uh, it was determined that for her, she would actually need FACO um, for the predominant reason of um, opening up that angle in terms of this chronic process. And so she ended up having a phaco done with viscogonial soniculysis, which is basically a fancy way of saying that a uh, visc um, viscoelastic was injected into her angle to help open up the angle. And sometimes what we do is we take the cannula and use that to uh, gently lyse the uh, peripheral sonychia uh, to help open up that, that angle and that channel. Um, she had a uh, pretty high powered lens placed uh, for a planal target and that becomes relevant later. Um, and sometimes we also combine these with eye stent or some other MIGS procedures as well um, to just further help um, the uh, further help their pressures uh, post-op. Uh, in this case, because her angle was uh, significantly open uh, following the cert or in the intra-op, uh, this was deferred. And post-op day one, her lens was noted to be fairly anterior. Pressure was a little bit better, but she was still pretty narrow. And so on post-op day three, uh, we did a quick MRX and because her visual acuity was pretty poor. And it was noted that she had a pretty large myopic shift. Um, and, and remember, we had aimed for a plano target. And so uh, her angle still appeared not narrow and her IOL was, was noted to be fairly anterior than uh, what would be normal. And so what exactly is happening now? Is this a um, continued process of her angle closure or is this something kind of new and different? And so uh, we think that what 
uh, was occurring was essentially a form of aqueous misdirection. And so uh, Dr. Tarhan gave a very extensive presentation on this last year. So I'm not gonna go into detail, but essentially this is a, uh, this is also known as malignant glaucoma. And it's a process where the lens iris diaphragm moves anteriorly. Usually there's a high pressure and uh, classically it actually occurs post some form of incisional surgery for acute closed angle glaucoma. But what happens, what's thought to happen is the aqueous, instead of being directed forward into the canal like it should, it is directed posteriorly into the, uh, and, and loculated into the, uh, sequestered into the vitreous cavity or hydrates the vitreous itself. And so there are multiple ways to uh, try to address this situation of aqueous misdirection. Um, oh, and, and I'm sorry, I also wanna mention that aqueous misdirection is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, essentially, uh, you need to rule out other causes of angle closure, such as choroidal detachments or hemorrhage, um, or some form of posterior or secondary reason to cause the iris or lens to move forward. And so there's various ways to deal with aqueous misdirection. And so one of the ways is to actually uh, rupture the hyaloid with the YAG laser. Um, and you can uh, do this um, actually through an LPI. Um, and so this is kind of known as a irritable zonular hyaloid rupture. Um, and so this was attempted uh, with very minimal improvement. Um, however, the pressure remained pretty high as well. And so um, surgical treatment was basically um, uh, was done. And so uh, essentially in this case, a complete uh, pars plane of vitrectomy was done and then a posterior ahmed tube was placed as well just to make sure that um, uh, there was flow. Um, now there are other ways surgically as well to address this. You can do an anterior approach with the iridozonulo hyaloidotomy, um, which was shown at Dr. Han's presentation. I'm not gonna show that again, um, but usually definitively for these types of for very resistant aqueous misdirection, a full pars plane of vitrectomy needs to be done. And so she's actually been doing very well and has had prophylactic LPI in the other eye. And so uh, I wanna give time for questions um, and discussion, uh, but I just really quickly just want you to be aware of two landmark angle closure trials that uh, you should know about. Um, so this is essentially the EGO trial, which, which looked at whether or not um, doing a clear lens extraction um, primarily for um, uh, angle, primary angle closure glaucoma versus doing traditional treatment, which is LPI medical treatment um, was more effective. And basically there was a lower pressure in the uh, uh, clear lens extraction group. And there was also a, uh, there's more cost effect effectiveness and uh, greater, um, they, they found a greater health status score with using a, a systemic uh, survey questionnaire. And then it's also important to know about this trial, which is the, uh, it's called the ZAP trial, but it's basically a trial that looked at doing uh, laser peripheral iridotomy for preventing prophylactically for um, angle closure glaucoma suspects. And so essentially they had 889 participants and they did LPI in one eye and the other eye was untreated. Overall, the um, number of events of angle closure in these suspects is very low. And uh, it did show that prophylactic PI did have some benefit, but because the incidence was so low, um, the at least the study uh, authors indicated that they did not recommend to have prophylactic PI for angle closure suspects. So main points, basically management of angle closure glaucoma can be very challenging. Be aware of this condition called ocular decompression retinopathy and other situations as well, and be aware of aqueous misdirection and um, as well. Okay, I would like to open it up and also open it up to Dr. Zabriski as well, if he'd like to make any comments. Uh, if uh, someone can unmute Dr. Zabriski. He should be able to unmute himself. Yeah, I did. Uh, thank you. Um, that was a great presentation, Austin. I, I know we're about out of time, but I just wanna make a couple of comments, although Austin covered it great. Uh, the, the point of showing these two cases is just, I mean, you, all of us, we've, we've dealt with angle closure in, in the middle of the night, and, and we've, we've you know, most of them respond to PI and medical treatment, and we move on, but, uh, you know, these were uh, unique in a couple of ways. So the first one, 
uh, was unique and that it just didn't, it just responded poorly to everything. But just an important point, you know, when you look at studies that are, that are uh, talking about taking the lenses out in acute angle closure, um, most all of the, if not all of the studies, the most important ones, they, they do surgery in the setting of what they call medically aborted primary angle closure glaucoma. So these studies are not done uh, go, going into red hot eyes like this lady had. And so you, you really do try everything conceivable to try to medically break the, uh, the glaucoma attack before doing any surgery. If you have to go into one of these eyes hot, that is, that is a real issue and fraught with difficulty. So we do try everything we can to break it. And she just was very difficult. But like Austin said, finally, after working with her and doing all of these things, we, we did you know literally kind of get a clear window, meaning the cornea kind of cleared enough that we felt like we could get some surgery done and, and which we did. And then she, she had a really uh, difficult course, but I, I think overall is, is doing all things considered is doing really pretty well. And I think her nerve is fine. And like Austin said, we might be having some effects from the decompression retinopathy, but but I think she slowly is continuing to do better and better. Um, but again, you just try everything you can to medically abort. And then the second case is interesting uh, because it's a very different picture. This is chronic. She already has a huge visual field defect. So, you know, you're wanting to get pressures down in, in her case, and you have a clear cornea. So your surgical options are open. Uh, we tried, you know, cataract surgery first, did gonial synecheolysis, her angle just opened up wide open. And so we felt like maybe we'd make some progress. And we did, I mean, lowered her pressure quite a bit, but still not enough. And uh, so we ended up having to do more. And, and just a, a quick little note, when you do a vitrectomy in these patients, you do have to do what I call a posterior PI. Um, and that's the critical portion is to, uh, you know, do a PI from the back, which means you're doing a, a zonular uh, a lysis as well as the, the peripheral iridectomy. And that's what really breaks the, the cycle. But then the final thing is when you're operating on these patients with these narrow angles and, and small eyes, uh, you will get refractive surprises. And it's not even in, in the setting when there's not misdirection, which this lady had, but even in non-misdirected patients that they have small eyes and they have these narrow angles, uh, you're gonna get some myopic surprises where the lens just stays forward. And I've had it stay forward even after going in and doing a vitrectomy and a, and a posterior PI. So that's something that uh, I would just caution you to warn your patients about in this setting, that there can be eyes that uh, come out myopic um, uh, just, just because that's the nature of where their lens rise. It just has that a forward displacement of the IOL, which is a little bit hard to predict um, going into surgery. So just those couple of points and uh, thanks Austin and uh, I appreciate it. It was a great presentation. We'll move on to Dr. Stoddard now. Hi everybody, I'm Wade Stoddard. I just got my screen shared here. All right, I'm going to be presenting on a case of a pediatric traumatic hyphema that rebled multiple times and try to leave a little bit of time for discussion because I think Dr. Stagg would like to pull the room on their experiences afterwards. So on January 24th, Dr. Stagg received a call from an outside provider about a kid, seven years old, a uh, boy, he was hit in the, with a Nerf gun bullet. Um, I think shot by his father, and accidentally hit him in the right eye, resulted in an eight ball hyphema. When he presented to the outside doctor, I believe he was LP, he was actually LP through the whole course that I'm going to present, and his IOP was in the 40s. And uh, the doc on the outside had taken him for a pretty prompt AC washout, but had encountered either too tenacious of a clot or re-bleeding and was unable to wash it out sufficiently, and the IOP remained elevated, so he was referred to the Moran. So he came on the 24th and uh, we got him into PCH pretty promptly for another washout. And I'll just go to the video here. So this video starts up partway through the procedure, but um, at the beginning of the procedure, the entire AC was this dense material that you see me tugging on with the vitrector there. It was like the whole AC was just filled with silly putty. And we actually, you can see there's a, um, 
a 2.2 or 2.4 millimeter incision there. We actually required FACO in order to get the majority of the clot out. And oh, thank you. It had to be mechanically dissected with MST forceps out of the angle and off the iris um, with a lot of care. I felt like it was so tenacious that I was going to cause an iridodialysis or something while I was pulling on it. But basically pull off chunks of it and feed it to the FACO tip and we in, ended up injecting uh, TPA about four times during this procedure to let it sit for five minutes and loosen things up and then take some more out and repeat and repeat. And we were in there for a long time. And we ended up with this um, stuff superiorly that we couldn't quite get out. This is pretty much what it looked like at the end of the case. The rest of the case is us looking at the angle and sewing things up. Um, he had some recession. Uh, the video quality of the angle is not very good here. Um, but it looked like there wasn't a lot of clot less left in the angle. He wasn't bleeding at this time on the table. So we were pretty hopeful that maybe this would be it. Um, and so that's how we left him after that first procedure. So this was his second AC washout. Um, and we elected at that time not to do an aqueous drainage device because it looked like we had, you know, declogged his angle and we're pretty hopeful that it would still have some function. Um, Post-op day one, his IOP was back up to 49. He was LP again and had a seven millimeter layered hyphema with a lot of that fibrinous material still there. And we were questioning, you know, did he re-bleed from TPA? How much of this is fresh versus old? And Dr. Stagg elected to take him back for a Ahmed implant and a wa another washout, um, which was done the day after that, which was the 26th. Um, he also was just very injected. All of his vessels, presumably from having his pressure high for a while, um, were just very large bore and it was a very bloody, difficult tube to place. Um, his AC was washed out again just by flushing and a lot of the blood was still loose and came out. Um, and at the end of the procedure, everything was successful. The tube was in the AC. It didn't look like it was bleeding much on the table again. Um, this is his B scan from after after that procedure, you can see that he's nice and deep and has some clot material still superiorly. Post-op day one from the Ahmed valve, his IOP was 30 and he had bled again and was still LP. Um, so he was continued on the standard medical therapy. And at this time, Dr. Stagg was considering that there might be something else going on. So he had consulted hematology and had sent for PTA, PTT, INR, and CBC just as screening. And it was all normal except for a slightly elevated APTT. And hematology wasn't concerned about something particularly severe, um, but they did agree to try a five-day course of aminocaproic acid oral. Um, so he was given two grams Q4 hours while awake for five days. Um, and then he was scheduled to see hematology. I don't believe he's had the formal consult with hematology yet. Um, but there was some concern based on his history that maybe he had some easy bruising um, and that he might have some kind of dyscrasia or di diastasis. Um, so post-op week one after his Ahmed valve, his IOP was 16, um, but he still had 100% hyphema. And at this time, he was starting to look bloodstained. So um, because of the staining, the dis even though the pressure was 16, it seemed to be getting worse. So he was taken for another washout. So this was his fourth washout. Um, and the view was very, very difficult. So I think Dr. I wasn't there, but Dr. Stagg said he could really only see the through the peripheral cornea. And so did as much of a washout as he felt like he could safely do. Um, and this is the uh, UBM before that procedure showing a lot of fibrinous material as well as some looser bleeding around it in the AC. This is that post-op week one, um, you can see the brownish blood staining here um, getting pretty opaque. And a few days after that, we can see that the um, clot is getting a little bit smaller, though there's still a lot of material there. And here's uh, an angled slit lamp view of the blood staining, which looks to be involving a, a good amount of thickness in the cornea. And then on his um, ultrasound, the this was on the 18th, so just a few days ago. He was still a uh, LP, but the clot is much smaller, but he does have this kind of um, diffusely thickened choroid that's thought to be related to hypotony. His IOP had finally come down into the single digits. 
So just a, a couple notes before we open up for discussion on um, intracam intracameral TPA. So TPA is tissue plasminogen activator. It converts plasminogen to plasmin and the plasmin goes on to clean, cleave fibrin products. So the thought is that if you use it in particularly tenacious hyphemas, that it can help clear it up faster. The downside might be that if you have fibrin occluding broken or fragile vessels, that by dissolving that fibrin, you obviously might get more bleeding. There's not a lot of data out there. They're all case reports and very small case series. It, it only fills up about 25 search results on PubMed. Um, so there's not really known what rates of rebleeding there are, but there are some series where people think it really helps hyphemas go away faster. Typically in adults, I've in, in the literature, you'll see dosages intracameral of TPA, anywhere from three micrograms up to one of my attendings in residency, like to use 30 micrograms. Dr. Chaya will use 25 micrograms um, in adults. And then in pediatrics, Dr. Chaya will use 12 and a half micrograms. There's really not standard dosing guidelines for this out there. And then as far as amino caproic acid goes, amino caproic acid is a lysine derivative. Um, it blocks several enzymes that are related to plasmin and basically it helps you plot better. And it seems to have a pretty good safety profile. It's not like giving this to kiddos or gonna give them a DVT or anything. Um, it does have an orphan drug designation for recurrent hyphema after some case reports that came out in the late 80s and early 90s in an animal model that suggested that it could reduce the uh, rate of recurrent hyphemas. Um, but again, this is not something that's particularly standardized. And the dosing for Amicar is, is by weight. So I wanted to open up the discussion. Maybe Dr. Stagg wants to come in and clarify what some of his questions might be, but has anyone else seen cases of such uh, tenacious rebleeding in the absence of known neovascularization or a tumor, or JXG, something that would explain it? like in this case, just after trauma. Um, the other question in this case is, why did he get such bad blood staining if his pressure came down um, and so quickly? And if the cornea service has any comments on that and any other tips or tricks that any of the more experienced glaucoma physicians have with TPA or Amicar? Yes, Wade, thank you. That was a great summary of the case. So yeah, I thought this, this case was interesting and stressful to me because uh, like, so he, he presented the day of the injury to the outside doctor and had just a couple millimeter hyphema from a Nerf gun injury. And we see that so much. And then the outside doctor had him follow up a few days later and the eye was filled with blood with the pressure high. So a rebleed, and we see that sometimes is pretty rare, but then he kept rebleeding. We had, to, he ended up with a total of four AC washouts. Um, and so that kind of kind of Wade's first question there. Do I mean we see so many hyphemas, especially like in triage and everything, we see so many hyphemas, hyphemas. We don't very often see one rebleed, but then where it kept rebleeding like that. I was just wondering if anyone wants to talk about any experience they've had with a case similar to that. Let's see if I can see everyone. Uh, I'll just make a quick comment. I have not, uh, thankfully, uh, ever had a patient uh, with this type of you know tenacious rebleeding, but it has always made me wonder why uh, why the recommendations for following up on hyphemas are so aggressive, right? Uh, depending on uh, where you look, you could find daily follow up for ten days, which you know is just just so out of proportion for what we routinely see. So I I, I think these are the cases that essentially uh, you know precipitate those type of, you know, significant recommendations. The other thing here is we don't have, um, you know, a, a lot of African Americans uh, in our patient population. And, and that's certainly something that uh, in other, you know, parts of the world, uh, where you do have sickle cell, um, you, I think, I think we, uh, they, they certainly see a lot more of this um, more severe disease. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. Because yeah, I mean, you, yeah, resident and then after residency, we've I've seen so many of those small hyphemas and uh, you're like seeing these kids every day and having them lay down and stuff. And you, just for how many we see and how few poor outcomes there are, I think you're right, is 
when you see something like this, that's really, really stress, really hard, you know. Um, and then, so the other thing, and I was hoping someone from Cornea, we've got uh, Austin here has got a foot in both worlds, which is nice. But I, I wasn't expecting blood staining because we had the pressure under control. And it, he didn't have blood in there for that many days and the pressure was under control. And it kind of went against what the classic teaching, you know, about the risk for blood staining and, and over what time course you'd expect that depending on the high eye pressure. So I don't know if anyone from Cornea have thoughts about that. Austin, I think that's you. You're yeah, the, so the corny. I was just going to say, I probably shouldn't be the one to speak for the rest of them, but um, actually myself and Dr. Zabriskie just had a conversation. We're having a conversation about this and um, typically he has found, and you know, I mean, he's dealt with quite a bit of hyphemas as well and um, high pressure situations. And, and, and typically he's found that um, usually there, there has to be some form of high pressure for there to be true uh, cornea staining, uh, cornea blood staining that would necessitate a, um, a transplant. Um, and, and that can occur over the course of a couple of weeks. Um, I mean, in this case, it seemed to be pretty early. So that's, and I know about this case as well. Um, and, and it's very unfortunate. Um, but without that high pressure sort of forcing those cells into the kind of the endothelial endothelium of the cornea, um, typically that, that doesn't frequently occur. Um, and, and the blood can be in there for a while uh, without truly staining the cornea permanently. Yeah, thanks. Brian, uh, Brian? Yeah, yeah. This, this is Norm. So, you know, first off, I just want to say this case is, in my experience, this is as bad as it gets, you know, and it's just truly a combination of just some unfortunate events. I mean, to have th this eye re-bleed so profusely so many times is just really, really unusual. I, I don't know that I've ever seen one quite like that. You know, you're talking about, uh, you know, four or so major re-bleeds in the anterior segment, but, and then the blood staining again, I agree with you. Uh, you know, I, I know back in the day, the Will's manual used to break down, like uh, has this, uh, you know, kind of this recipe practically of, you know, if, if the pressure is this, you can, you have to evacuate blood after X many days and stuff like that. And the higher the pressure, the shorter the time. But certainly we wouldn't expect blood staining like this to occur at, at the pressures that you have. But it just, it's just one of those things to show that, you know, things happen sometimes and that, that you don't expect. I've, I've had a couple of kids, uh, you know, interestingly, of, of, uh, as I'm trying to think of the blood staining episodes that I've dealt with, um, they were both, the ones I can think of are both in kids and, um, and the blood stain was terrible, but they both had really high pressure. And, uh, and the, by the time the patient got to us, actually, uh, the staining had already, has, had already occurred. And, and um, you know, I went in and had the exact same experience you did, took out the clot, but there was just, it was completely blood stained. And the only thing you could see was just in the far periphery. Uh, but those both had been associated with, you know, outside high pressures that were really significant for about a five to seven days time, as I remember. But, you know, I think you did, I think you did everything right and everything you could. It's just that this is a really tough scenario. It just, it just really is. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for talking to me through it as, as it was happening too. I was talking to both Norm and Craig like, multiple times, getting advice and thoughts because like I said, it was, a, it was a stressful case for me. But uh, so uh, Brian Zog is here raising his hand. You, do you want to talk, Brian, or are you able to? Yeah, sorry. It, it was uh, not letting me unmute there for a second. So um, Craig brought up a point um, in the chat about whether or not we can use OCT to kind of figure out the depth of the blood staining. And, and it might be useful to have that. Um, it might give us some information there. Um, it can be kind of tricky to, to tell for sure on anterior segment OCT, but sometimes you can see it there. Um, but I, I completely agree with all the comments that have been said here that this is just an unexpected sort of result of his hyphema, but also 
you know, with the amount of amount of times that he rebled, and then you have to kind of question one thing too is like during the washouts, are you potentially pushing blood kind of into the cornea too with the pressure of the washout? Um, I don't I don't know that I know much literature like when you're doing a washout, how how could that could affect sort of blood staining too? Um, to try to think, okay, what what potentially could have precipitated the blood staining if we were managing the pressure um, in this situation as well as we could. Um, it definitely, even thinking through that, it still is an unexpected outcome. So, um, so now we're kind of stuck with a blood stained cornea with a pressure that's under control. Um, and my, my recommendation essentially would be to just give this time to clear and, and just sort of see what happens. Um, it'll, it'll start in that peripheral cornea and then kind of clear centrally if it, if it is going to clear on its own. Um, but if not, we'll just have to kind of assess, try to figure out the depth of it and decide on what kind of a transplant he might need um, to, to sort of optimize his vision. He's seven, is that right, Brian? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think just, what, what's his treatment? Actually, like sorry, going Brian, he's, he's eight. He just, his birthday was last week. He was in, in clinic for his birthday. I brought the text in and we all sang happy birthday to him like oh, it read Robin. <laughs> So what, uh, what's his ongoing sort of treatment now? Like what is he on medication wise? So right now I've got him on, you know, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but I've got him on steroids, antibiotic. And I think I've, I think I've got him off all pressure drops at this point. Okay. So, so, so my recommendation would be to treat him with kind of long-term steroids. Um, you're not going to really worry about a cataract from the steroids in him. He's going to get a cataract from other, other issues. So I wouldn't worry much about that side effect of the steroid in a kid. And then um, obviously managing his pressure to make sure he doesn't have a steroid response. I think you'll, you'll have that well under control. And so this, the steroid could potentially sort of help with that blood staining. Um, I'm not aware of any other treatment out there. I'll, I'll try to look into it for you and see if there's anything else that, that could potentially try to at least reverse it somewhat. But, but like we mentioned in a conversation that we had last week, I'm happy to see him and kind of help follow um, kind of his course to, to figure out the best next treatment for him. And nice. and Dr. Thank you. Yeah, he's scheduled to see you. And did, who was going to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, Dr. Zog, just correct me if I'm wrong, but especially, I mean, with a view like this, like the one that Wade has up on, on here, you know, um, a, a endothelial ker keratoplasty would probably be uh, very difficult, if not uh, completely impossible. And uh, I, so in, in this patient's case, I, if it, if it doesn't change, um, are, are we think we're thinking more of a full penetrating keratoplasty for this patient? I, I, that's what I would have thought. Yeah, for sure. That the hope is that over time you'll get some clearing. Um, and you don't, you don't need a, an amazing view for a DSEC, but you do need a view. And in this case, you're not going to have one. So, right. so that, that for sure is something that we'll have to just see how much clearing will happen over the course of, of time. And, and maybe that anterior segment OCT can help us sort of understand that and following a pachymetry and just kind of those, those surrogate markers to try to figure it out. So. Yeah. The OCT is a great thought. I'll, he's coming to clinic on Friday. So I'll do that. So uh, one other thought that I had was, so his eye has been through a lot, you know, four washouts we talked about, and then just the rebleeds and the inflammation. I was wondering if that may have contributed to the blood staining, if there was some breakdown of the endothelium or endo decrease endothelial function or something that maybe let, made it more prone to blood staining um, than otherwise it would have been. And then one other thought, one other thing just that I'm worried about now, because that's what we glaucoma doctors do is we worry. Um, so his, his pressure has, was holding like good, like in the teens, but it started to go down and even Dr. Dr. Harry was a little worried about some thickened choroid, maybe from hypotony. His pressure is probably in the single digits now. It's hard to get a good applinated measurement with his age. But I don't know. I mean, I, I think the valve was working. I think the valve was keeping the pressure. I don't think there was like accessory leakage. So I've wondered if maybe the clots healed and he's got a big cyclodialysis cleft that's making the pressure go, like putting him at risk for hypotony which will be another problem to deal with, so. Yeah. 
yeah, to me, that's kind of the disaster scenario, right? Is that you, you end up with kind of the, the hypotony of the eye and that, that usually will lead to the demise of the eye if you can't get that pressure up. So, so yeah, potentially having to tie off that tube or, or something else to kind of keep that pressure into a, in a healthy range is for sure something to, to be thoughtful of for sure. Yeah. I wonder if Norm or Craig, do you have any thoughts about that? Like if he's going hypotenuse, I, I almost worry that tying off the tube wouldn't help because it was maintaining. Okay. Like, and, but I can't see if, I, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts about that? Like management of hypotony, if he gets that going forward? Well, yeah, I, I would just say that if he does, uh, I mean, if he does go low um, and you've got a tube in place and you've really got low pressure, I think you're obligated to tie the tube off um, and, um, and and just see what happens. You know, you're right, though, that if it's a hypotenuse process due to either psychodialysis cleft or just ciliary body infarction and kind of you know, malfunction, which certainly can happen in any of these kind of acute high pressure type cases. You know, I've seen that many times, unfortunately, over the years where you go through an acute, like an acute angle closure or an NDG or whatever it might be. And, it, and um, you know, basically the thought is you've just either infarcted or damaged the ciliary body to the point that, that you, um, um, you know, end up with low pressure. Uh, you know, I, yeah, we can talk a long time about that because that that happens. But in this particular patient, if if the pressure does go low, then I think I think you have to to tie off the tube um, just to see if that makes a difference. And it might not, but I think you have to do it. Right. I don't know that I would do it now. It's pressure eight now. I don't know that I'd do it at pressure of eight. But if it starts to just continually go down, then I think I think you you'd have to do that. Nice. Yeah. Brian, uh, Brian, this is Craig. I would agree that you should tie off the tube if he becomes hypotenuse or if there's evidence of choroidal thickening and hypotony. Um, one thing that may be helpful too, if he's, I know the pupil's almost blown already, but try and rotate the ciliary body back with chronic um, cycloplegia uh, may help to seal off some of those clefts if there are any clefts. Nice. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that I do have him on uh, cyclopentylate right now. Yeah, you you might. I, it's just a small thing, but uh, you know, if if you're really worried about it, you might consider putting him on atropine if you if you can, like low dose or something. I, th I think atropine in this setting for that particular problem is definitely yeah. better than cyclopentylate. Yeah, good thought. I had him on cyclopentylate earlier, but I think I and it's just kind of carried over. But I I'll, I think I'll switch him to atropine. That's a good. Yeah, thought. yeah, yeah. I, I I probably would. Griffin's got something here, and then we're probably running out of time, but Griffin says, it seems like this corneal blood staining occurred in spite of Dr. Seg doing everything right. I wonder if it represents a more dramatic initial injury than originally appreciated. And that, that could be the case. So the outside doctor who did the initial washout said it was just, there was just active blood flowing while he was doing the washout. And he kind of just stopped and put glue on the eye because he couldn't, like it just kept bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. So I think, I think it was a, a bad injury to start off with, so. But great, thank you. I, I don't know, Craig, do you wanna say any closing comments and then? Uh, no, just to want, want to recognize Dan Clegg. Our, our pharmacy team here is amazing. Uh, we've been trying to get Amicar in our protocol and Dan was kind enough to make sure that we could procure the oral Amicar version uh, so that we could start that on this child. Initially, we thought there might be a topical version that we could compound, but there is no commercially available prep of Amicar yet. Uh, so we recommend if you have any refractory or difficult hyphema cases to consider working with Dan and the pharmacy team to um, administer oral Amicar. Yeah, it does. I mean, it does r remind me of how things have changed in terms of just m management of these hyphemas. Back, you know, back when I was a resident, man, we would we would just be so much more aggressive about putting anybody in the hospital and patching them and Amicar and all that. We should just do that routinely and it's not done that much anymore, but uh, it, it's kind of, I don't know, sometimes uh, these, these, these really bad cases can happen. So it's like Jeff was pointing out, it's, it kind of makes you rethink some of that old stuff uh, sometimes, especially when you see a case like this. But again, I think everything correct was done. It's just, uh, just, just, 
I, the, the initial trauma just was very severe. I think that's obvious. Great. Thank you all. Uh, so I believe that concludes our grand rounds for uh, Oklahoma, and thank you all for attending. Thank you.